This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, an organization that celebrates the hobby of homebrewing, protects the rights of homebrewers, and provides members with world-class brewing resources. Visit homebrewersassociation.org to learn more about membership. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 28th, 2019. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, homebrewers AJ and Justin Hart join us to talk about Astarte, a Bronze Age style beer inspired by an archaeology course AJ took in Cyprus after hearing about it through this very podcast. So watch out, Basic Brewing Radio is changing lives. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint and our brewing rainbow shirt. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool basic brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, they say that uh, new listeners will find us that way. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. This past Monday, I released a Basic Brewing video episode featuring Steve's Spiced Blood Orange Wheat Beer, which was delicious. And uh, Steve has started a blog page on stevesbrewshop.com, and the first entry is about that beer, along with the recipe. So head on over to stevesbrewshop.com to find out more about that. If you follow me on Instagram and such, uh, you might have seen a photo of my small batch that I brewed in my Instant Pot. Jeff in Skeen, Texas, uh, had seen me doing kettle souring in the Instant Pot a while back, and asked me if uh, somebody could, could brew an all-grain batch of beer just using the Instant Pot. Well, I tried it, and it worked. I, uh, <laughs> I shot a video of the process for uh, a future video episode. The, uh, it, it, was a, it was a one-gallon batch, essentially, a six-pack. The boil was a bit more vigorous than I anticipated, so I got a smaller amount of wort than I wanted that weighed in at a specific gravity around... 1.130. <laughs> I was trying to make uh, a, uh, a double IPA or an imperial IPA, but that was a lot bigger than than I anticipated. So I looked at this sludgy stuff, and I, and I thought about topping up the wort in the fermenter with some water, uh, but then I thought, eh, see what happens. <laughs> so so I pitched a, a whole packet of USO5 in, in about half a gallon of wort, Um and there was activity for a couple of days, but it slowed down. The The yeast was sludge, sluggish in the sludgy uh, wort. So uh, four days into it, I got some spring water uh, and uh, I, I topped off the uh, jug. To and I, and I estimate that I brought the original gravity to somewhere around 1080, so more manageable. So the the yeast is feeling better after that. The airlock activity uh, pick up, picked up after I diluted that sludgy stuff. Uh, so I'm hoping it'll turn out all right. This is, this is a hoppy beer, so I'm calling it my Instant Pot Imperial IPA or IPIIPA. <laughs> Fingers crossed on that one. Uh, we've been talking every now and then about Safale S33 yeast and uh, whether it's a Belgian strain or an English strain, uh, Mark in Bellevue uh, emailed and sent a chart showing uh, the genome mapping of different uh, yeast strains. And Mark says, according to this, S33 is in the mixed origin group right next to Windsor. Maybe Steve is correct, and it's an Edme strain. Thanks, Mark. And uh, on that same topic, Chris from uh, Bascule Brewery in Lorain, Ohio, Writes, uh, I wanted to share my experience using the enigmatic Safale US or S33. In a pinch, I used it to make a golden strong ale, Belgian golden strong ale, and I too was surprised at its rather un Belgian like character. But then I recalled a little factoid that I read 
about Belgian beers. Chris said, I wish I can remember where I read it, uh, but it's my understanding that what we know as the Belgian style was actually introduced to Belgium by a Scottish brewer. It's my theory that what we recognize as the spicy, fruity character you get from Belgian styles is actually a mutated version of what probably started out as a much more neutral yeast. Chris says, I know I'm kind of grasping at twigs here, but my theory is kind of confirmed when you taste a beer like Triple Carmelite, which tastes more like a Scottish ale than a Belgian beer, in my opinion. So there you go. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Then, (laughs) the plot thickens. Steve Wilkes uh, saw that email, and he sent a screenshot from a brewing app that he uses on his phone. And on the screen for S33, the description is general purpose, and the source is listed as English ale yeast. So there you go. More more grist for the mill. Uh, We're not sounding too defensive about this whole issue. (laughs) Uh, let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. Uh, I went on the uh, Homebrewers Association, uh, Association website and uh, I downloaded a recipe for Bell's Two Hearted Ale, a clone of that, uh, which uh, it's a it's a favorite beer of mine. Uh, and I set up my Warthog electric brew in a bag system from High Gravity, poured in my strike water, and set the controller to mash uh, at 150 degree. F- uh, degrees Fahrenheit or 65C, and it doesn't take long for the water to come up to temperature, but it also doesn't take long to run to the post office. So I did. I I just let the system do its thing, and I went out and got got our mail, maybe sent off a package or two, and the, then when I got home, the strike water was all ready to go at the per- perfect temperature. And I'm, I'm spoiled nowadays. In the old days with my propane system, my propane system, I'd I'd heat my strike water a bit hotter than I needed, pour it into my Rubbermaid cooler mash tun, risking scalding myself, let the temperature settle out because you've got to preheat that tun, and then and then I would pour water, cold water, into the cooler until I hit my desired temperature. And then I'd take out the amount of water that I put in to adjust the volume back where I wanted it. And then if I did manage to hit my mash rest temperature uh, where I wanted it to be, that would fall over the next hour, even if I wrap the cooler in blankets and quilts and such. <sighs> Those days are over with the Warthog controller from High Gravity. Uh, I set it, and it stays rock solid for the entire mash time. And uh, dialing in the power level in the boil mode is super easy as well. Uh, now, on my two-hearted clone, when I collected my wort at the end of the boil, I was only point zero zero one off the specific gravity that the recipe called for. Now, that doesn't always happen. (laughs) That's not a guarantee if you get one of these systems, but it sure is fun when it does happen that way. Um, High gravity's electric systems take the pain out of propane from one, two, and three vessel systems, five gallons to two barrels. High gravity has you covered. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your electric brewing purchase. Check all those out, all those systems, all those controllers, uh, along with videos on how they work at highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. Okay, I got an email a few weeks ago from Justin Hart that I thought was a lot of fun. His wife, AJ, had gone to study ancient brewing techniques in Cyprus with Dr. Ian Hill, who had been on this very show talking about that very topic in January of 2013. Well, AJ and Justin brewed up a delicious beer inspired by her experiences, and we tasted it on tap at Bentonville Brewing Company. Well, Justin Hart, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. Glad glad to be here. And AJ Hart, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio as well. Yes, thank you. Happy to be here. I, I introduced you first, Justin, because you were the one who wrote me the email. Uh, but I have a feeling that I'm going to be talking to AJ more uh, because uh, you've had the, the more experience in this. Uh, but so let me let me let you start, Justin, and say kind of kind of give me a, a background on how y'all got interested in beer and specifically in brewing beer. Well, uh, I can identify the moment that I actually started drinking good beer, and that was I was in the military and decided to pick up a six pack of Yingling one day instead of just a Bud Light. 
And so that got me started on, on liking to try new beers, find out more interesting flavors and stuff like that. Uh, then when I got out and I came home, uh, a friend of mine gave me a Mr. Beer kit for my birthday. I believe we did two batches in that. Uh, actually only bottled one. And was like, no, 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 no. We, we've actually got to really get into this. And went down to, uh, it was then the home brewery, picked up all our gear and started brewing like that weekend. <laughs> so, uh, and then that was, that was 11 years ago now, I think. And uh, so we've just been kind of doing it on our own ever since. And where did you enter into the picture? Uh, with the Mr. Beer kit and the bottle bombs and yeah <laughs> so from the beginning yes yeah he skipped that part <laughs> <laughs> so I, I take it that uh, that your enthusiasm uh, uh, gain you know grew over the years and that it became something that really kind of brought y'all closer together do you did you collaborate collaborate on brewing or how did that work oh yes we collaborate on brewing quite often um If anything, I tend to be the one that sometimes comes up with really crazy things while we're eating dinner or something like, oh, wait, these two flavors in a beer. And it's like, wait, that that can't work. And sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. So (laughs) I clean the kegs. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there you go. (laughs) <laughs> my my wife Susan is sitting at the end of the table here with us, and uh, she's my silent partner in, uh, in this in this endeavor. And she uh, she she tastes my beers and gives her opinion, but she does, she has no no uh, uh, designs on getting into the brew house. So she she helps bottle. She does. She helps bottle. She says, uh, "Here we are at uh, Bentonville Brewing Company in Rogers, Arkansas." which is <laughs> the former home of uh, Ozark Beer Company. Uh, this is a temporary home for, for Bentonville Brewing Company. They're going to be they're building a new facility. Uh, but we are drinking uh, something that is a very interesting beer. And, A.J., I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you start to tell the story of, of how this beer came to be. It's got, it's got quite an extensive origin story. Okay, so what we're drinking is called Astarte, uh, and it is a beer that was developed based on an experience that I had at a experimental beer archaeology project in Cyprus, which uh, this is kind of nice because it comes full circle, originally heard about on Basic Brewing Radio. So <laughs> uh, Justin actually one day um, was listening to the podcast and sent me a message saying, uh, there's they're putting out a call for uh on their podcast there's a call for a project in cyprus where they are doing experimental archaeology trying to brew bronze age beer uh, and they're looking for uh ar- people with an interest in archaeology or a background in archaeology and an interest in beer and that checked a lot of boxes for me because my my background is actually in, in archaeology i've never actually uh had a job in archaeology because um it's that's it's a little hard to find that something to pay the bills. And at the time I, uh, was, I'd been with a, uh, I'd been working in it for almost seven years and I was kind of ready for a change and wanted to get back to a little more of my, my archeology span roots. And I thought archeology span plus beer, that's, that's, that's going to be hard to pass up. So went ahead and quit with Justin's support, quit my job and went to Cyprus for three weeks. And, uh, did some experimental archaeology with that. Uh, we built a malting kiln um, using Bronze Age methods, um, which was a lot of like stomping in mud and making mud brick. Uh, and those things are really heavy. Um, I kind of <laughs> got pretty buff working out. Um, and I got a great tan because uh, Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean. Um, we were less than a kilometer from the beach, uh, which was great. Um, but, you know, it was really hot too. So, <laughs> so Justin, you you told your wife to quit her job, and then you sent her away for a month. We have a strange relationship sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, it just seemed like too perfect of a thing to pass up, and a, an excellent way to transition into new things. Who know? Who knew what was going to be on the other side of that three weeks? So, I was excited for her to go. So did did uh, Ian Hill? Was he there in the at the at the? Uh, at the place where you are? Oh, yes. He was in there mixing mud brick with us and, and putting it putting it on there and, and directing us and saying, okay, no, wait, that one can't be there. It's, the wall's going to collapse. 
the next day. I told you the wall was going to collapse. <laughs> so yes, um, some trial and error there, which um, that's all about experimental archaeology. So, um, but and uh, with that, uh, we actually brewed uh, kind of a, an experimental brew uh, in Cyprus, uh, open fermentation uh, with adding in some figs and uh, honey and things like that. And um, unfortunately, it was actually probably the worst thing I've ever had in my life. Like, it, it was all the off flavors, like the, the funky gym sock, cheese. It, it, was, it was terrible. Um, but the, the basis of some really cool flavors were there. And there was a lot of, you know, ever since then, coming back, I was thinking that could have been the basis of a really cool brew. And I really wanted to give it another try. So... I I have to I have to interject I have to uh, uh, to tell a little story about uh, Professor Hill uh, he, the, on the show that he was on. You know, sometimes Skype is free and worth every penny, and this was like the worst experience I've ever had with Skype doing an interview. Uh, like the first half of the interview went okay, and about you know maybe thirty minutes into it, it started to cut out. And so it was random. At first, it was like, you know, we would talk for a couple of minutes and then boom, it would shut off and I'd have to call him back. And I'd say, OK, the last thing I heard from you was this. And he would just pick up right where he left off, telling this story or answering the question. And it got to where 45 or 50 seconds would go by and the connection would drop. And so <laughs> so if you listen to the interview, he does such a good job of telling the story that I was able to edit it all together. And you can't I don't think you can tell. And he, uh, he was in Scotland and I think it was in the middle of the night when we interviewed or something. You know, it was it was ridiculous what he had to go through to, to do that interview. And, and I'm I'm very grateful for him for uh, to him for doing that. But uh, anyway, that's the behind the scenes story on that. So. So you and I both probably experienced his uh, patience. Yes, yes, and his accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Justin, when 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 AJ came back, did you experience sort of uh, was she changed in the way she approached the the brewing process? Well, um, it seemed like she she definitely had an interest in in really grabbing onto some stranger old things you know historical methods ingredients things to play around with you know we keep kept kicking around the ideas of doing like stone beers and and other kind of boil and fermentation methods but uh, so it seemed like she definitely had a uh, uh, elevated interest in those sorts of things after she got back. And y'all uh, are doing some education with local homebrewers here, right? Uh, yes. Um, actually, also just with the general public, but that tends to, the interest in beer tends to be among homebrewers as well, <laughs> so especially in this type of beer, because it's a little bit out of the ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> so were you able to integrate this, your learning into those classes, and were you able to actually brew some drinkable beers using these influences? Uh, yes, actually, our, our first uh, homebrew batch of Astarte, um, against all odds, uh, came out really well, and we were doing a uh, beer history talk with that. And I was, I was, it was combined with kind of like a, a whirlwind tour of world beer history. And so Astarte, in that case, was just a footnote as in terms of a Bronze Age Mediterranean inspired beer, uh, it, basically ingredients that would have been available in the Bronze Age Mediterranean using, you know, uh, like smoke malts to um, emulate um, a malting kiln that would have been wood fired or actually probably more likely um, peat or dung fired but we, we did not we did not <laughs> get that go that go that in in detail but <laughs> no poo beer no no maybe, maybe a future iteration but <laughs> warn me warn me if you do <laughs> So, so the uh, so you brewed the the beer that that's called Astarte, which uh, we have in front of us. So, where does the name come from? So, uh, Astarte is um, inspired by um, my time in Cyprus. Um, so, Cyprus is, uh, according to mythology, the birthplace of Aphrodite, uh, but. Aphrodite wasn't really around in the Bronze Age so much, but the predecessor to Aphrodite would have been a, a Phoenician goddess um, by the name of Astarte. So actually, the p correct pronunciation would be 
probably something more like a star T, but um, so I, ins- because this beer was inspired by uh, Cyprus and you know, it, so it's Aphrodite is the goddess of love and all of that. So thought in a start day would be a nice homage to that. And how did it get the attention of the brewers here at, at Bentonville? So we're we've been kind of friends with uh, Katie and Bo and Lee uh, since pretty soon after uh, Bentonville opened in their original location. We come in a lot. We talk to them a lot. And uh, actually, I think at that at the time that we brought. Our, a bottle of Astarte over. Were you serving beer here? No, not at that time. Okay. But I had previously. So, so Amanda or AJ had previously worked here serving beer, and so we had a good rapport with uh, the the owners and brought in a bottle and gave it, gave one to Bo to try, and uh, he sends me a text message that uh, basically goes. What is going on in my mouth as he tries to taste this beer? Because it, it's, you know, com- I, I, I tell him, Bo, this is a very strange beer as far as normal, you know, everyday craft beer that you'll find around here. And uh, he he really enjoyed it and thought that it would be something worthwhile to, to scale up into the big system. Now, was that beer, uh, your homebrew, was it a spontaneous fermentation? No, no. Um, that I, I learned my lesson. Uh, I, I didn't quite want to experience uh, the, the full flavor array that happened in Cyprus. I, I wasn't brave enough to try that again. Um, <laughs> but so it was a, trying, but trying to capture those other flavors because Bronze Age Brewing, it probably, yes, it would have been open fermentation, but there would have been a little bit more... Um, of a brewing tradition around that, or that that's the speculation. Um, so there may have been, you know, the magic stick that may have been there to inoculate it with the good yeasts or using specific, you know, the, the yeast on the skins of the figs, things like that. So it may not have been uh, as haphazard as a bunch of college students <laughs> trying to brew it in, you know, sur- you know earthenware vessels. Um, there, there may have been more of a science to it in that way. <laughs> There was probably some selection along the way of brew, brew, brew. Oh, this one's really good. Use this stick in this container to brew the beer in from now on. And, you know, and, and, and uh, that, that's the theory, at least. And it seems to make sense that once you get something that works, you keep doing it. Uh, and it, it's unlikely that, that they did get something good the first try. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so Bo was inspired to, to give it a go. Yeah, he uh, he was excited by you know just the newness the, the or I can't really say newness for a Bronze Age beer, but uh, <laughs> new to modern palates uh, experience and you know as as friends of the brewery and home brewers, he knew that we were involved in trying to bring education to the area of, of you know home brewing and, and how much fun it can be. So he wanted to you know help support us and and show the world a little bit I think of what we could do. So, so what? What's in this? Well, first of all, cheers. Cheers. Yes. Susan across the table. Susan's drinking a Kolsch. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Mm. Now I have to say, uh, Justin, you warned me that this was a quote unquote different beer, and that that it's been compared to to interesting things on Untapped and such. Uh, I believe there's at least one review that calls it beef jerky in a glass. <laughs> Even Susan's making a face at that. She, it's, a, it's a drinkable beer. It's, it's actually, uh, it's got a nice smoky component. Uh, there's, there's no head on it uh, uh, for, for a reason maybe that we'll get into here in a minute. But it's got, got a nice uh, malty character. Uh, it's got a, a nice uh, balancing bitterness um, it's very drinkable, and it kind of it kind of reminds me of some of the smoked beers that Steve Wilkes has made in the past. You know, they're balanced, they're drinkable, they've got a nice smoky character, but then they're not. It's not like licking an ashtray. You know, it's 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 it, it's a nice sitting around the campfire kind of smoke, rather than. And also, it's not like you know eating a bunch of you know a couple of rashers of, of bacon. You know, it's 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 a good balance. It's a nice balanced beer. So, so AG, what's what's in this beer? Uh, well, so the it's interesting that you noted on the um, 
the bitter notes uh, because there is no hops in this beer because um, in terms of what would have been available in the Bronze Age Mediterranean, hops may have been there, but it would not have been the the hop tradition that we have today. Um, so for bittering, we actually used thyme and wormwood. Mm. Uh, mostly the wormwood for the bittering, but uh, the thyme kind of brought in a nice earthy tone to it. Um, there's figs, which we think that may be where some of the meaty flavor comes in, perhaps, um, or combi- combined with the um, the rock malt, the, the smoked malt, um, for that smoky flavor. So, so where do where do those bittering ingredients come in? The, the, we uh, threw all those in at the last five minutes of the boil, so they, there's no real time for isomerization or anything. So it's uh, and actually, I'm trying to recall. I believe the wormwood is actually thrown in dry. Or right at flame out and then a little bit in, in, into the fermenter. So. so so, where do you get wormwood and how much do you use in a five-gallon batch? <laughs> so in a five-gallon batch, I, it was a very small amount. It was only a teaspoon. Wow. Um, and you, we picked it up at our local homebrew shop. Um, this is... Um, so it, this is nobody's chasing the green fairy uh, with this beer. Uh, <laughs> no worries there. Um, but it... Uh, wormwood, we've actually used it for some homemade sodas and things. It a little bit goes a long way. Um, we made, um, actually inspired, um, there is a book by Mary Azette called Speed Brewing, in which she describes um, a absinthola, which uh, uses a little bit of wormwood there. Um, she calls for quite a bit more than we were willing to uh, to toss in there, because it, it, it packs a punch. But, yeah, so it, like, I think it was a teaspoon for five gallons. So if we see any hallucinaza- hallucinations, <laughs> boy, I'm, I'm halfway into this beer. <laughs> it's only f- five, uh, 5% five alcohol. Any, any hallucinations on the way uh, home uh, that uh, they're going to be real and not uh, in- inspired by the wormwood? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's delicious. I gotta say, um, I say delicious a lot on the show, but it is. It's really good. I was expecting to be very polite about how it tasted, <laughs> uh, but you know, I would, uh, I would, I would have another uh, snifter of this. This is really good. So, h- how old is this, and how has it changed over time? So, I believe we brewed this in August, August or September of last year, um, and. It seems to me that the the sour and the smoke profile have balanced out. When it was fresh, the smoke was pretty forward to me. But AJ's a lot better about describing flavors than I am. Like I said, I'm the keg washer. (laughs) So, yeah, we brewed it. I think our brew day was on the big system was August 12th. Our initial homebrew was uh, early last year. Um, So we brewed our first batch, I believe, in February for an education event in March. Um, that was that was a lot of intense brewing at that time because we brewed, I believe, eight beers in the course of two weekends. So that was a little yeah. intense there. Um, so, but that was our initial homebrew batch, and we then we were like, "Wow, this turned out really well. Let's see if we can does lightning strike twice." And in this case, fortunately, it did. Um, when we dialed that recipe in, and then we brewed it on the big system here at Bentonville Brewing. Uh, our brew day was August twelfth, and then. Uh, it was released in early September. Um, and what were the challenges in scaling up from, from homebrew to, to the big system? Well, one of the big questions is, what does Wormwood do at this scale? You know, uh, just like with hops, it doesn't, it's not a linear, uh, just easy multiplication, and there's no data on what Wormwood does in beers. So we just really had to take a stab at that. Um, and the time ended up being a little bit, lower amount than what we had calculated just for lack of ingredients and timing uh so but the the flavor still came through so that one's obviously not linear either so it's just very interesting to see there's no nobody really has any data on on this stuff and i don't think we even have a way to measure how this stuff would go in there's no wormwood calculator out there on the internet somewhere. That <laughs> Beersmith 4 coming up. <laughs> Are you listening, Brad? <laughs> Is there, but were there, were there any, you alluded to some, some issues or a question with, the, with the, the figs. So we used 15 pounds of chopped figs, which if you've ever chopped 15 pounds of figs, that's not fun. Dried, uh, dried figs. 
And Bo and I sat there and, and discussed whether we should actually worry about putting the uh, figs into bags before we throw it into the boil. And we decided to just for safety's sake throw, go ahead and throw them in bags and make it, it mostly to make it easier to throw them into the kettle, which was a great thing because once we hit the whirlpool, we found out that figs sink, and <laughs> and a bag of figs will plug up the outlet pipe on a pump <laughs> or, or on the kettle going to the pump, and so it was it was a, a, a tense time of reaching down in there with the longest paddle that we could to try and pry that thing off the outlet so we could whirlpool <laughs> the beer as it, you know as we were trying to get it ready to go into the fermenter so if we hadn't you know, used the bags it would have ended up as fig slurry mm. i'm sure and probably at least one dead pump probably two wow. well there you go lesson learned uh and I, i'm assuming that this is not uh, spontaneously fermented either what yeast did you use uh we used uh nottingham from uh is it lalaman or lalaman Close enough. Uh, the the Nottingham Nottingham yeast. We, uh, oh, no, actually, no, no, I'm sorry. No, it's no. Bell Saison. Oh, okay. I, 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 <laughs> yes, Bell Saison. Okay, never mind. Bell, the the Bell Saison. <laughs> sorry, we've done well, a lot since then. So. <laughs> and you don't, you don't have your notes in front of you, so I'm 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 putting you to the test no. here. So it, it, it maybe that it I'm sure that that yeast adds to the complexity of this beer because there are some really interesting characteristics that that come out of that out of that yeast. So we we selected Belle Saison specifically trying to pull in a little bit of that sourness um or hoping hoping for a little bit of sourness flavor. Um again not brave enough to opt for the spontaneous fermentation <laughs> or open fermentation because um Jim Socks once was enough for me but um <laughs> I, the first uh, competition I ever judged, uh, they put me in the Belgian category, uh, and uh, one of the s- descriptors that I wanted to write on a uh, uh, on a uh, judging form was animal shelter. So that's <laughs> <laughs> because there was the aroma of disinfectant, and there was some fecal uh, characteristics in there as well. So, <laughs> yeah. So I can imagine the brewer said, "Ooh, this didn't turn out so good." Belgian, <laughs> which is not it's not the way it's supposed to work. So, so cheers again to to a, a, an excellent. Uh, I think I think it's very good. I don't know. I don't know why uh, why anybody would would complain about it. Maybe if you if you drink a Miller, Miller Lite all the time or something like that, maybe you know this would be challenging for your palate. But for somebody who's you know had a lot of uh, somebody who's been to club night uh, at uh, Homebrewcon <laughs> since you know 2006, uh, <laughs> this is not the weirdest thing <laughs> that I've uh, consumed. So so good job. Thank you. So, so do you want to talk about your your organization or your uh, what is it a company an organization or what? what who are you and what do you do? <laughs> uh, so um, we, we are Mewbrew, and it's really just we put a name towards what uh, we do together uh, with brewing experimentation. Uh, we like to build hardware, do tinkering, mess around with recipes, brew weird stuff, and uh, we try to write about it and. Uh, I try to write about it, and I'm usually not very good at it. I've got about a hundred drafts of articles and <laughs> only five actual articles. But uh, so it's just uh, something that we try to do for fun. Uh, and being an engineer, the Mew in Mewbrew was just too much of a joke, in joke to be able to to pass up. Uh, not being an engineer, I don't get it. <laughs> well, it's it's the the Mew symbol is micro. So. Oh, okay. Oh, I get it. Okay. I, I, we've had to explain it a lot. <laughs> if I ever own a business, I'm not using that. <laughs> and so do you have a space? Uh, yeah, our basement. No. <laughs> so, no, I mean, we, we just um, have our, our, our brew shop downstairs. <laughs> so. And, and you are also, uh, reading the footer on your email, you're also uh, an officer in the uh, local homebrew club. Yes, uh, for 2019, I'm the vice president of the Ozark Zemergists Homebrew Club. First Tuesday of every month. Uh, find us on Facebook because we currently meet at Schlotsky's and Rogers. <laughs> Arkansas, uh, out. Arkansas's uh, ABC laws make sure that we go to the right place. <laughs> I like their bread. <laughs> we used to go to Schlotsky's a lot. 
Uh, and and then how how would you find? Uh, uh, I assume you have a website for the Mubru. It's Mubru Okay, that's what I was so Spell it for. So M U Brew dot Beer. Okay. Well, lots of people spell spell brew in many different ways. Okay. So. We <laughs> What other projects, uh, are, are there any other uh, ancient-inspired projects in the works? Or what kind of guidelines can you give people who want to do a beer that, in, that is inspired by Bronze Age brewing? What are some inspirations that you can throw their way? So um, I am a big fan of the so-called Indiana Jones of beer archaeology, uh, Patrick McGovern. He has uh, published several books. He, if you're familiar with Dogfish Heads, um, Midas Touch, and other books like that, um, I'm sorry, other beers like that, um, he, uh, he's worked with uh, Dogfish Head brewer Sam Caligioni. Thank you. I was about to butcher that. Yes, um, he has worked. They have worked together to uh, as collaborations to come up with several um, more ancient and historical beer recipes. Um, there's a couple of books out there that Patrick McGovern has. Uh, Uncorking the past is a more scholarly version of that, but um, um, if if you geek into that, it's it's a great resource. Um, in terms of projects, we have. Uh, in our pipeline we did re- we as part of our beer history talk we also did a kind of a theobroma a dogfish head theobroma clone um which turned out interesting um at some point i would like to do a true chicha uh, where you actually chew the corn um but once i we have to convince people that saliva in their beer is Pre-fermentation is really going to be okay. It's not going to hurt anybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people's bodily fluids and I, that's. Uh, I haven't gone over that line yet. <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't sample the uh, rogue beer that had the um, the the yeast that was harvested from the brewer's uh, beard. Uh, <laughs> Susan's making a face on that. That's where I di- I didn't cross that line. I was like, ah, I just can't. Get- I know it's safe. I know it's boiled. I know everything's good. I just can't go there. So uh, <laughs> there are even stranger ones out there uh, d- 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 in the dark corners of the internet. If if you really want to look, there's yeast sampled from even stranger places. <laughs> yeah, enough said. I've seen that one too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but chicha, yeah, that's that's where you you chew the corn and the enzymes in your saliva start uh, to break down the starches, uh, and then again, I guess you you it would be boiled, so you you would be uh, sanitizing the the uh, the beverage. Mm-hmm. But still, people spit is people spit. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the people drawing water out of a, a cow pond to be able to brew with too you know it's like it, it really freaks people out but it's gone through the mash it's spoiled you're fine it's killed everything it's 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 kind of kind of ironic that we're talking this way because the uh, the episode i think that you heard about the the call for uh entries was the episode that i talked to the organization that was taking treated sewage water and brewing <laughs> Having a homebrew competition to brew with that. <laughs> it all comes around <laughs> in a nice circle. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I'm putting my mic at you, AJ. I, uh, talk about poo some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so that, I mean, that would be, that, that's a consideration of, of if we really wanted to get as super authentic version of a star day as possible. Uh, one, I'd have to go back to Cyprus because they're going to have different wild yeasts there, um, which I, I'm in. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting, uh, all the different factors, like the, the malting kiln that we built. Um, there was even thoughts of, like, how, um, which Ian has, uh, Ian, Dr. Ian Hill has some great paper or papers published regarding the, some of the, the science around the, the structure of the kiln. And that, that was part of our excavation project with that was kind of analyzing, because unfortunately in archaeology you only get like the bottom third of the wall, so you kind of have to extrapolate and guess what the top part would have looked like. Was it covered in, in thatch or was it mud brick or, you know, how did it collapse in? Was it opened at the top? Um, but thinking about how that smoke would have circulated in, circulated in there, what the temperature gradient would have been, how roasty those malts got. Mm-hmm. Um, were they 
maybe drying meat or fish in there as well? Would that have affected the flavor? There's all those interesting factors to think about uh, in terms of that flavor. And another thing to think about is the modern palate is much different than what the ancient palate would have been. At, at that point, they were probably like, hey, this is great because I that all those sore muscles I have from working all day, they don't hurt so bad after a couple of glasses of this. So. Yeah, and preservation wasn't as good, so maybe the you know the meat that they were eating was <laughs> tasted a little worse than what they were drinking. So yeah, there's a lot of factors that uh, yeah the modern palate is is a little spoiled in, in many ways. Well, this is fun. Anything else to add for the cause? Oh, there's there's always thoughts working. Um, we're uh, Justin and I are both um, probably self describe. I think we would describe ourselves as foodies. So there's always. Um, you know, if we're traveling or just trying trying different foods, there's always that, ooh, what 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 kind of a beer would this make or, or interesting flavors. Um, one of them we did, um, we kind of came up with the idea, and then Justin brewed it. Um, was almost like a margarita inspired beer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, actually, we we just fairly in the last year had our first child and so while I was pregnant I was off beer but um, I I kept coming up with all these crazy flavors of beers that I wanted once I I could have beer again and I I really missed salt and so I was like oh we need a margarita beer and now of course now there's lime salted gozas all all over the place now but um, and then Justin adapted one with mezcal in it and so yeah we've we've been having all kinds of fun. Well, if you come up with something else fun, uh, let me know, and uh, you know maybe we'll get together and, and do this again. That sounds like an excellent plan. We'll do some more. Uh, we played around with tapaches as well, and those are fun. That was another from uh, Maria Zett's book, uh, Speed Brewing. And we did a tapache. We've done a number of five-gallon batches of that, just saving pineapple rinds and peel and seal sugar. And, I mean, that's it, it takes just a couple days to make. And actually, that is my father's favorite thing that we brew. Out of all of the beers that we've brewed, he that that's the one. He's like, I really like that tapache. What kind of beer is that? Well, it, it's not actually a beer, Dad. Okay. <laughs> but it is a fermented brew, so we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. Stay tuned. Watch this space. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say hi, Susan. Hello. <laughs> Well, thanks again to AJ and Justin. That really was a fun and tasty beer. And uh, I'm hoping that they collaborate on more beers that are inspired by ancient techniques. And keep us posted. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, extract brewing and partial mashing, stepping into all grain, low-tech lagering, and decoction mashing, and introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free basic brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books so you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.